Good morning and welcome to worship with Memorial Boulevard Christian Church Disciples of Christ and Webster Groves Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I'm Pastor Jeff Moore and I'm glad you're with us. We hope you'll sing along with the hymns, pray along with the prayers, and that you'll have communion elements ready so you can join us for the Lord's Supper. Muy buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Bernarda Rendón y bienvenidos a la iglesia a escuchar la palabra del Señor, que es el mensaje que nos da mucha fortaleza. Morning, my name is Kitty Baumgarth and I'd like to welcome you to Webster Girls Christian Church. I'm Charlotte Pullen. And I am reading every spirit prayer. Shall we pray? Wise and faithful God, on the surface, the cross appears foolish. Human wisdom seeks control. But in your wisdom, you sent your son Jesus, the truly enlightened one, who understood your love and your desire for justice in the world. That story we tell of Christ crucified is the story of one willing to die because of the injustice in the world. It is truly in his death that we discover the truth that we also must die to this life where injustice reigns and take on the full and rich life of discipleship, seeking in quality and justice for all. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to encourage us, to help us, to lead us in the right path. Give us insight, strength, 
and divine motivation through your word. Let us embrace the cross as we move through Lent in worship and in our daily living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, children and families. It is great to be with you uh, for worship this morning. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about Lent. That is the uh, liturgical season that we're in. It's when we think about the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness, and we use it in our uh, Christian calendar to reflect on our faith and uh, what does it mean and uh, things like that. So it's a very uh, important time of year and um, it got me thinking about what does it mean to even be a Christian, uh, to follow Jesus. And uh, we're gonna be reading in scripture this morning that the uh, early Christians had some troubles too um, because the things that they were doing looked kind of strange to the people around them. And it got me to thinking about uh, what do we do as Christians that might look strange or, or might be different than what's around us. So I thought of three examples. I'm sure there's a lot more, but I thought of three ways um, that you might uh, be able to think about what it is to be different than the rest of the world. So um, in our modern culture, um, you know, there's this uh, push to work hard and to um, make a lot of money and time is money and hurry, hurry, hurry. And um, everything is about the money grab. And um, so the one way that being Christian can be different than that is that we are um, commanded in the Ten Commandments to take time to rest, to have a Sabbath, to spend time with God and to um, rest our bodies, rest our minds. 
So that's one way that we're a little bit different or that uh, people might think of us as different. Um, another way I was thinking is the way we use our money. A lot of people will say, you know, you've earned your money. You should spend it all on yourself. You know, don't give your money away. Those people are lazy and they're trying to take advantage of you. And um, the truth is, even Jesus said there will always be poor people. And if you look around, there's always um, people who are working hard and trying hard who are still hurting and struggling. And so as Christians, we are called to give some of our money away to help other people. And um, that could look kind of strange to people that don't understand us. Um, and then a third way, and I really, I really like this one. Um, if you watch the news um, or read the newspaper or on the internet at all, there's a whole lot of really bad news. And um, it's not that bad things aren't happening. There are some really tough things that are happening in the world, but the the overall message is that things are pretty hopeless, that humans are, are somehow doomed. And um, as Christians, we've got good news. And our good news is that um, God heals us and blesses us, um, that Jesus is our hope and light in the world, and that the Holy Spirit is here to help us, to guide us, and to walk with us when we've got trouble. So we are really, um, that's, that's really the main way that we are different than the rest of the world. We have this hope and this comfort and this strength that comes from um, God. And um, it really um, changes the way that we look at life. And so as you are walking on your Christian faith journey, if you feel a little different or a little strange, um, sometimes it's okay. We've all been there. And um, it, it just means you're doing a good job. Uh, thinking about uh, what it means to be a Christian in this world. So let's pray together. Ready? Thank you, God, for this time together this morning and for the season of Lent where we think about what it is to be Christian. Help us to walk in your path and not in the path of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a good day. I am reading from the first first Corinthians chapter one verses eighteen through twenty five. Christ the power and wisdom of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written I will re destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. In a world where wisdom seems to be everywhere, words of wisdom, a word to the wise, as we say, received wisdom seems to offer us possibilities for how to live our lives, about who to be, whom to believe. With all of this received wisdom everywhere, true wisdom might be hard to find. We kind of go with what we know. We accept the authorities that are presented to us. The loudest voices sometimes win out all arguments, such that argumentation seems difficult and 
tortured in many ways. What does it mean for us to think about what true wisdom is? What does it mean for us as people of God, as children who follow Jesus Christ as our leader, who understand God as a parent, to actually understand wisdom? Well, sometimes it seems as if we know right from wrong, up from down, right from left, and wisdom is what we do all the time. I can remember the first time that I had to learn to drive on the left side of the road when I moved to Lesotho. I'd never done that before, but I knew that it was necessary. The steering wheel was on the other side of the car, for goodness sake. And I remember driving along on the left side of the road, saying to myself, sometimes quietly, sometimes loudly, stay left, Jeffy, stay left, stay left turns were the hardest because I just wanted to go into that other lane because it seemed like the right thing to do. It seemed wiser. It seemed normal. And that's the thing, isn't it, with received wisdom? There are a lot of things that seem to us to be wise, but it's just because they're normal. That's the way the world seems to have been designed around us. But the thing is, we see in many places in the Bible and all around us in the world that sometimes the things that are called wise are indeed not wise at all. I'm teaching Old Testament this semester, and we've been looking at a number of stories. There's one story about Pharaoh and the Hebrews at the beginning of the book of Exodus. And the Hebrew says that uh, Pharaoh decides to deal wisely with the Hebrews so that they do not grow in population and overtake Egypt. Sometimes the English translation is shrewdly because the translators themselves can't believe that Pharaoh thinks that's wise. But of course he does. Of course it would be wise if you are an oppressor to keep down the people that you oppress any way you can think of. There's another place in 2 Samuel 13 where a character deems it wise, a character is deemed rather wise, um, because he knows how to do things in David's court. In fact, he arranges it so that one of David's sons can assault one of David's daughters. Again, English translators don't know what to do with that, so they use words like crafty or shrewd, even though the text says wise. Of course, it's received wisdom. It's received wisdom that if we manipulate other people who have less power than we do, we can keep our own oppressive power. It's received wisdom that if you enslave people, you must find ways to make sure that they remain enslaved. But that's not true wisdom. True wisdom, of course, comes from our scriptures as well, from the fact that all humanity images God, that we are part of God's creation. Yes, true wisdom can be hard to find, and once found, it can be hard to identify because there's so much so-called received wisdom, so many things that seem normal to us, that sometimes discovering true wisdom is as difficult, it seems, as trying to drive on the other side of the road. It just doesn't work. Paul talks about the cross of Christ. Foolishness to the world, certainly something one wouldn't want to proclaim. Paul talks about that as wisdom. God's wisdom somehow in a crucified Savior, a paradoxical term, Paul finds and understands a new way of life. Somehow in a crucified Savior, that paradox of crucified Savior becomes a benchmark a hallmark, a watermark, a way of being, a true north, a guiding star for a community to live its life. But the thing is, it's so hard when other people are pushing other wisdom. Wisdom that says, if the Romans crucify you, you stay dead. Wisdom that says, if you're a rebel peasant, you don't deserve to live. Wisdom that says, some people can oppress other people and get away with it. And yet Paul and the other Christians build up communities around this paradox of a crucified and risen Savior. Communities that forgive one another. Communities that share possessions. Communities that 
follow the Shema, the Hear, O Israel, in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Communities that understand that Jesus claimed that as the greatest commandment and one like it. Love your neighbor as yourself from Leviticus. Communities who can live that way might not seem wise by world standards. Yet, says Paul, this foolishness, this foolishness of equality, this foolishness of love, this foolishness of shared possessions, this foolishness of understanding that we are created in the image of God is God's wisdom. How can we see wisdom in a cross? How can we see wisdom in an object of terror, in an instrument of destruction and death? James Cone, in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, a book that the Koinonia class is studying now, says the paradox of a crucified Savior lies at the heart of the Christian story. That paradox was particularly evident in the first century when crucifixion was recognized as the particular form of execution reserved by the Roman Empire for insurrectionists and rebels. It was a public spectacle accompanied by torture and shame, one of the most humiliating and painful deaths ever devised by human beings. Comte goes on to say that Jesus died this way required special explanation. It made no rational or even spiritual sense to say that hope came out of a place called Golgotha, a place of the skull. For the Jews of Jesus' time, the punishment of crucifixion held special opprobrium. Given their belief that anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. This is from Deuteronomy 21, 23. Cone goes on, thus St. Paul said that the word of the cross is foolishness to the intellect and a stumbling block to established religion. The cross is a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the news that hope comes by way of defeat, that suffering and death do not have the last word, that the last shall be first, and the first last. Cone, of course, is right. This paradox is at the heart of our Christian message, and what it means is often difficult to decipher if we continue to try to live by the received wisdom of the world. You know that wisdom. That wisdom that says only you matter, that individual choices are the most important. The wisdom that says take what you can and keep all you have. The wisdom that says that your neighbor should be out for themselves. The wisdom that says it's all about me. That wisdom also sets up hierarchies. That wisdom allows us to think, to believe, and to act as if our neighbors might be less than we are. It allows us to oppress other people. In fact, it sets up a world where it's seemingly impossible to imagine, impossible to think that we could be sisters and brothers, that we could be siblings in Christ, that we could share possessions and resources, that we could love one another, that we could forgive. That seems so foolish. Those thoughts seem so impossible. We might want to agree with Alice in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. We might want to say there's no use even trying. One can't believe impossible things. But what about the Queen's response to Alice? I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Well, I don't know if you've had breakfast this morning. I don't know how many impossible things you've been asked to believe yet. But Paul asks us to believe this impossible thing, that the cross of Christ, foolishness to humanity, is God's wisdom. That God's self-giving love that a way of forgiveness, that a way of turning toward one another and turning toward God is indeed wise. That oppression, death, 
crucifixion represents the world's foolishness, that claiming the humanity of each other person and rejoicing in their freedom and sharing it with them is God's wisdom. That this every person for the person's self business that we cling to so, so difficultly in our world is foolishness. So, Paul suggests that we step through the looking glass. Paul suggests that we begin to understand that the truth of who we are and the truth of who God is is not bound up in the way that Romans believed that they could silence all those who opposed them with the cross, with force, with oppression. Paul lifts up to us the possibility that love, forgiveness, resurrection, and new life represent true wisdom not the received wisdom of the world. The received wisdom of the world that says that some can work for a living wage and others don't need as much money. The received wisdom of the world that says that those who already have much deserve it and those who do not don't deserve any more than they have. The wisdom of the world that says one skin color says something about who's better and who's worse. The wisdom of the world that says that some genders are better than others. The wisdom of the world that says that one person's sexuality should be the deciding factor of other people's sexuality. The wisdom of the world that says borders matter to God more than people matter to God. That wisdom says Paul is folly, it's foolishness, and the cross proves it. When the Romans say to Jesus and his followers, fools, fools, you thought you could follow a crucified and risen Savior. Fools, you thought you could follow a God who loves and forgives and calls you to a new way of life. We'll show you, we'll nail your wisdom to our cross, and you will never utter it in this world again. And then what happens? A community rises up around a savior who had arisen. God's wisdom rises up in the midst of the world's foolishness. Paul says the world would call this folly a stumbling block. But for those of us who are being saved, he says, for those of us who experience this as a message of salvation, of well-being, of wholeness, of health and hope, for those of us who are being saved, this indeed is wisdom. And so what does Paul say we should do? Paul says that we should honor one another's gifts, that we should understand that we bring lots of differences and that those differences come from God and that we should understand we're connected one to another just like a body and its parts. Paul says that we should love. Paul even says, sometimes that seems hard now. Sometimes it seems like we're not exactly sure what to do. Sometimes we can't see it clearly, but we need to know there will come a time when we will see this clearly. We must live it now. We must. We must live it now. We must be the people of God who foolishly follow God's wisdom, who wisely scorn the world's foolishness. Let us, people of God, share with one another. Let us, people of God, close our ears to those seemingly wise words of received wisdom that say everything's about the individual and there is no community. Let us wisely care for others. Let us wisely listen to the words of Jesus when he calls us to a world and a life and a community of service. Let us focus on our God with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our strength. Let us love our neighbors as ourselves. The only way out of the world's foolishness is to start living as if we believe God's wisdom, to start living as if in a crucified and risen Savior, a forgiving, loving God has spoken and acted. And if we continue to practice 
if we love one another and love the world around us, if we forgive, if we share resources, if we lift up Jesus our Christ as we follow him and honor God with everything we've got, soon we'll discover that God's wisdom becomes a way of life. So it took me a long time to learn to drive on the left side of the road. And after three years of driving on the left side of the road, I was a pro. That's exactly what it felt like to drive for me. And then I got in an airplane and I came back to the United States to visit for two weeks. And I rented a car at O'Hare Airport. And lo and behold, the steering wheel was on the wrong side of the car. And I was leaving one of the busiest airports in the world, and I had to drive on the right side of the road, and it seemed wrong. The more we live God's wisdom, the more the received wisdom of the world will seem wrong, the more we'll recognize it for the foolishness that it is, and the more we'll understand the way of the cross, self-giving, loving, forgiving, sharing resources as the people of God. The world makes that sound and seem as if it's foolishness, the kind of foolishness that only a wilderness wandering people would believe, the kind of foolishness that only people who go to graveyards and cemeteries expecting miracles would believe. But people of God, we are those people. We are people called to a new kind of wisdom. In fact, the oldest wisdom there is, the wisdom of a creative God who loves us and the entire world and all that is in it, who gives us Jesus, who calls us to follow. That, siblings in Christ, though the world deems it foolish, is what it means to practice wisdom. Amen. Our congregations continue in mission and ministry. If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus Christ or become a member of either Memorial Boulevard Christian Church or Webster Groves Christian Church, please contact us. We'd be delighted to talk with you and pray with you. And now please join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, you tell us what you want of us. Do what is right, speak only what is true, do no evil to your neighbors. Yet time after time we stumble and fall. We step back from the right thing because it's too risky. We tell small lies to make ourselves look good. We harm our neighbors as payback for real or imagined slights. Forgive us, O oh God, and patiently lead us back to your ways and your truth. Please join me in the responsive assurance of pardon. Brothers and sisters, our God shows us the way. Our God welcomes us back to the truth. Our God stands at the center of our lives. Our God forgives us. Thank you, God for your boundless love, for your unending patience, for your overflowing mercy. Glory be to God who forgives and restores. Light of
Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Adrian Hill and at this time I have the privilege to extend an invitation to all who wish to partake in communion here at Memorial Boulevard Christian Church and Webster Grove Christian Church. Um, we extend an invitation to all who wish to um, partake in this meaningful event. None are excluded as we remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. thankful for being here this morning. We're thankful that you are with us, not only this morning, but always. We're, you're with us and we're with each other, whether we're beside each other or if we're apart and yet connecting with each other through something like Zoom or if we're together, but don't see each other, 
and maybe we don't even hear each other, but we're together. We're together even as we've been together with all of your followers all through the years and are still together with them. We're thankful that you sent your son, Jesus, to be with us. And he gave himself for us. When we partake of the bread each day, each time, we think of him and think of how he gave his body for us. And when we drink the wine, we think of how he gave his blood for us. And he, he's with us, and we're with him and with each other. And we thank you for all of that. And we pray in his name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat at the table with his disciples. And he took the bread that was sitting on the table. And he lifted it, blessed it, and broke it. And said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of this, do this in the remembrance of me. And in a like manner, after the supper, he also took the cup. He blessed it, giving thanks to God, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. We invite you to partake of these elements as we celebrate this communion. Of God of our ancestors, God of the present day, and God of all futures, we thank you for having called us to this table. We thank you that you call us to be people of faith who trust in you enough 
to step out. We ask that you be with us as we move from this table into more worship and praise and into the coming weeks and months. We thank and praise you in the name of Jesus our Christ. Amen. God of creation and of all wisdom, we look to you this day with hope. We look to you this day from the midst of what seems like our despair. Coming through this pandemic has been a difficult journey, O oh God. Walking in the wilderness of our Lenten journey often seems difficult, O oh God. And yet we know that you walk with us, you travel with us wherever we go, and you call to us through Jesus Christ. We're grateful that we are welcomed and called into communities of love. We're thankful that you gather us around a communion table where we know your presence through Jesus our Christ. We're grateful for your Holy Spirit that animates our work in the world. We lift up our prayers today, O oh God, for our communities of faith, Memorial Boulevard Christian Church and Webster Groves Christian Church, and all of our members, friends, and partners. Give us the strength that we need to remember and realize your presence and share it with the world. We thank you for your wisdom that the world calls foolish. We lift up to you today, O oh God, many among us who are grieving, many who are working to heal, many who face difficult situations. We pray for the family of Brian Dorsey, who recently passed away, for Kenneth Tate Sr. as he recovers from surgery, for Leighton Stewart as he regains strength, for Marilyn Combs as she does the same, for Debbie Werner as she regains strength. We pray together for the family of Don England, we pray for the family of Doug Richmond. We pray for Jane Yount, Rhonda Young, Shaw and John Smith's grandson, Michael, for Andrea Belt, Karen Lebb, and Kay Hartman. We pray for John and Carolyn Dias, for Bill and Arlene Sullivan. Hear our prayers, O God, for Angela Baker and Susan Burney. Pray, O oh God, that you hear us as we lift up our voices for Barb Farmer as she anticipates surgery, Barbara Merrill's friend, Percy Gibbar. We pray for Devere Shoup. We pray, O oh God, for Katie Kingston. A prayer of celebration for the continued healing of Annalyn Howell's brother, Brian for Brian O'Donnell, for frontline workers, O oh God, and all essential workers who help us to have the things that we need and want in life, even at risk to themselves. We pray, O oh God, that in the midst of this pandemic, we can be a part of the solution so that our neighbors can have food and shelter and clothing and health care. We pray that your wisdom be known to us and practiced by us. We lift up these and all prayers in the name of Jesus our Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, people of God, go forth from this place and this time to, though it seems foolish, live God's wisdom of love, compassion, sharing, and forgiveness. Go forth in the name of our God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen.